With gold having recently hit a new all-time high, many viewers are wondering, what's next for the price of gold? To answer this question, I asked two of the smartest gold experts in the world to join me for an exclusive new interview. And in it, you'll hear their predictions for where gold is headed next, the good news and bad news for gold investors today. And perhaps most importantly, you'll get to see the inner workings of a powerful system for investing in gold, a system which has delivered audited gains of 706% for more than two decades, crushing the return of gold, the returns of major gold funds and more than doubling the S&P 500. To be among the first viewers to see this exclusive new interview, head to 2023goldrush.com to sign up for a reminder when we go live. Again, that's 2023goldrush.com. All right, we are back with G. Edward Griffin, the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, the book that inspired millions uh, worldwide. Always uh, a pleasure having him on. Uh, thank you for, for being back for part two, where I want to talk uh, more about the Federal Reserve. In essence, if I had to sum it up, you've said that it's neither federal nor a reserve. It is not owned by the federal government, and it does not hold real assets in reserve. In reality, it is a giant debt factory backed by the full faith and credit of the government or tax paper. Is that a correct summary of the way you see the Fed? I think so, yeah. That pretty well covers it. There's one, one phrase left out of that that I think should be added back to it, and that is that it's a, the nature of this group is a cartel. It's a, that means it's not just one one entity that's a group of different entities in the same uh, field, banking, and normally you would expect them to be competitors against each other, but they've joined together for the specific purpose of moving in unison and eliminating important points of competition between them so that they can conduct business in the absence of competition, which means that they can charge more money and make more profit uh, on their products and services. So in part one of this talk, we took an in-depth look at central bank digital currencies and you brought up the banking crisis. Now we're 90 days in, it seems like a much longer time, but you know, we've seen uh, what's happened at the regional uh, bank level. Talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on this, on this banking crisis and why, why, do you think it's interesting that it had happened at the regional bank level or no surprises there? I haven't thought about the level at which it's happening, but uh, I have thought a lot about the fact that it is happening because I have be I've become very, very uh, skeptical about the way this type of information is presented to the public. By that, I think that uh, I think that the the decision to allow a lot of banks to quote fail was made a long time ago. It was probably planned, and even the dates were probably selected a long ago, fairly accurate dates. Uh, I don't think any of this comes as a surprise to those involved in it, and I think it's programmed to a large extent. So when they use the word crisis, it's a little bit misleading because I think they want us to focus on the idea that, oh, there's a big problem here, and uh, we've got to, the poor banks are failing. The poor banks, we've got to save them, and so forth. And uh, when, in fact, I think it's part of the, of the plan that's been in place for a long time to reduce the number of uh, banks, maybe not the number of buildings with banks in them, but to concentrate uh, the banking community into fewer but larger banking institutions until finally there's only one. I think it's part of a plan, a uh, condensation of the whole community. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but I've noticed it over the past uh, two years at least that uh, when I go into uh, my bank here in, in the Los Angeles area, um, there's I had a couple of branches I go into. One of them was a very big branch, and it was always hustling and bustling with people lined up at the counters and you know a lot of transactions going on at the uh, at the counter level. And increasingly, I saw less and less of that and more desks being placed out in the lobby and where people were sitting down and talking. Mm -hmm. I never paid much attention to it. 
And then I finally realized one day, walked into the bank, and they had completely reworked the whole structure. They'd taken down the walls, and they eliminated most of those counters. And that was reduced way back to the corner. And there were yeah. little rooms that you could go into now. And I, I started to inquire. In fact, I was there just last week when the Bank of America I was talking to a little girl about that. She was a very nice agent at the desk. We sat at the desk, and uh, I said, what's going on here? So the bank is changing its character. She said, well, yeah, you know, we're becoming more of an of, of, uh, investment institution now, and less and less banking because it's, the currency isn't a big deal anymore. And she said, we've been told by management that uh, they're going to lay off a huge number of us, and they're going to be starting to close banks and branches, because banking is changing, you know. I said, well, yes, I do know, but tell me what you know about it. <laughs> but so I was, it was interesting to get her insight. She was saying, I'm going to go look, I'm looking for another job. She's looking around to make sure nobody's listening to her, you know. We got into an interesting push. And I said, I'm, I'm looking for another job. <laughs> really? And uh, so I don't think this so-called crisis is a surprise. I think it's been planned a long time. And it's part of the movement to move toward this cashless society. Who needs a bank if you don't if you don't have cash? You know, that's uh, that's what's going on. So now they're making it seem like something that we have to worry about, and we got to bail the banks out or something. I don't know what they're going to do with that. And you know, getting back to it, always just always leads back to central bank uh, digital currencies, right? Like if you. You know, if you follow the the banking crisis or or any of these um, news items happening on on the periphery here, it just always leads back somehow mm -hmm. to digital currencies. Yeah. Well, that's been their dream for for centuries. I read some old books on this that when I was doing research for this for the Federal Reserve, and they were talking about a, a cashless society long, long, long before banking even matured to where it is today. You know, it was always a dream. Because cash, cash gives people autonomy. It allows them to be independent of others. If you got money, baby, you know, you got the cash, I've got the place to go. That's sort of jokes about that. You know? I want to talk de-dollarization, um, since this is a very hot topic uh, with many of the experts that have come on. And I know the last time you were on, um, one of your points is you, you, weren't, you wouldn't be surprised if part of the the mandate was to weaken uh, the U.S. dollar to usher in, again, the central bank yes. digital currencies. Um, now everyone's talking about de-dollarization and, and the rise of the, the BRIC nations. And I'm curious to get your, your thoughts on if you feel we're really at the end of the road of the dollar as the reserve currency or not yet. Well, I do feel that we're at the end of the road. Um, now, the question is, how close to the end of the road? I don't know. I've been very, very... Yeah. Better question. I have been very... Uh, I have a very poor report card uh, for predicting dates on things. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm practically flunking out every time because I always think these things are going to happen sooner than they do. But they're somehow able to kick the can down the street a little bit more than I thought it would be possible. So I have... I agree hesitate to say when, but I think it's soon. Let's just leave it at that. Um, but that is happening and probably going to happen in our lifetime, even my lifetime. Is, there's no doubt in my mind about that. That's, not how, that's how close. Do you think the U.S. government, do they want it to happen? Do they want to weaken uh, the U.S. dollar or are they going to be prepared to fight back? That's a revealing question because we say, would the U.S. government fight back? That implies that you think there's a difference between the U.S. government and the banks. And my view is the banks own the government. The government will do whatever the banks want them to do. Now, they can pretend to regulate. They can ask tough questions. They can, they can criticize. They can say, oh, these bankers ought to be controlled or reg regulated. They can pretend to fight each other, each other. But the bankers are in control because if any, any politician really gets very seriously out of hand and and actually does something to limit the power of the banks, not just talk about how important it is to limit the power of the banks. If a politician actually does something, proposes a piece of legislation that would do it, uh, they're soon 
uh, demonized in the press or something and, they're, and some scandal is revealed or uh, something happened and they're no longer in office. And the politicians know this. I've talked to some of them. They said, look, I'd like to be more, more positive in my opposition to the Federal Reserve. But if I am, I know that uh, I will not be in office anymore. Well, that, I'm happy you brought that up. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on DeSantis and Florida banning central bank digital currencies? Well, I think it's an interesting proposition, but will it last? I don't know. There's, I, I'd like to think that, that DeSantis is the real thing, and he probably is. I'm not going to question that, but I'm always alert to the fact that these people in, that are calling the shots are very, very shrewd, and they know how to play the game. It's kind of like the the football play, the Statue of Liberty play. You know, the quarterback goes back. He looks like he's going to toss the ball, but he's not. He's going to run with it. And uh, so it's deception. So we know that the the bankers are very good at that. They they pretend to be failing or they pretend to be on our side, but at the last minute they're not. So I'm always alert to that possibility. And that's not to say that I, I'm calling DeSantis as a controlled opposition leader because I don't believe that at all. But it's possible. I think we have to keep that open in our minds. When I had George Gammon on of the Rebel Capitalist, mm -hmm. um, he's also a, a huge fan of your work and believes in the end of Fed movement. He pointed out that the Fed, rural, Federal Reserve, technically, or legally, I should say, cannot issue a central bank digital currency. It would be illegal for the Fed. Now, uh, your thoughts on this, or is it just simply something they could wave away? Well, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about it that. Uh, well, I think it's probably true that the Fed cannot, I mean, that the uh, government cannot issue a, a digital currency because there's constitutional limitation. It says it has to be a coin, silver or gold coin. It would have to be any, if the federal government issued it, that would be limited to that. But the Federal Reserve, it means the banking cartel, is issuing our money now. And they get, they're getting away with it. They're issuing paper currency. Now, the government couldn't get away with it because the Constitution limits what the government can do. But the Constitution doesn't limit what a private bank can do. So in essence, they got around that limitation by uh, transferring the power to create money from the federal government to the Federal Reserve System. And now, since they're both the same, see, that the trick they pulled is that People still think the Federal Reserve System is different from the government, and they don't realize that there's a difference between legal constitutional money and, um, mm. and currency that's not backed by constitutional principles. As long as you can spend it, that's all people care about. They don't care about its legality or constitutionality. The third pillar, you know, I know I spoke, we spoke the banking crisis, we spoke central bank digital currencies, I also want to get your latest thoughts on inflation, because since we last spoke, the Fed uh, has managed to uh, dramatically bring down uh, inflation, and some would say they've definitely won the fight here. I know you've been made it very clear that they created the inflation in the first place, but your thoughts on the inflationary times uh, that we're living in and how you're navigating it. Well, I think it's pretty clear that we're living in a period right now of great inflation. I'm going to guess it's, it's greater inflation than we have ever experienced, even in times of war, because the amount of money that's coming into existence daily now is just, it's just unbelievable. We, the quantities that uh, it was being brought in like five years ago into, into being five or 10 years ago was, in my view, just unbelievable. And today, now it's 20 times or 50 times more than that. There's no, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that I've talked to that this, this can never be repaid back. This is a, this is a, a game. The idea that they're creating money and debt that's going to be paid back is uh, just for show, because there's no, there's no physical way for that to happen. So that everybody knows, everybody knows in the business that at the end of this game. The money system collapses or has to be replaced by something else. So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the realization of that knowledge that this system that we have allowed to be gradually built up around us now has to be eliminated. 
because you can't continue it anymore. It's just, it's through, it's kaput. The $32 trillion in debt, $32 trillion. And when you speak of a new system, you're speaking of the Great Reset, correct? Yes, that's, uh, yeah, the Great Reset is more than just banking and more than just money. It has to do with personal privacy and, pol- and property and all the rest. But yeah, the Great Reset includes that. So I guess, you know, mm-hmm. as we're wrapping this interview, um, I know that you're a big proponent of holding gold and silver um, as part of your, or should I say, protection um, in, in, given this landscape, if you could just talk to us a little bit about what you're doing uh, financially uh, to prepare. Well, that's a, another good question. Uh, yes, I, I'm an advocate of gold and silver as a uh, in, inflation hedge and uh, as a means of maintaining some, some currency that's in private use. It might even be black market use because I think the people who are working toward this uh, cashless society probably don't want people like me or you to have gold or, or silver coins. So they'll probably pass a law making it illegal because they'll say these nasty people are going to upset a beautiful, wonderful system, the Great Reset. They're, going to, they're dealing with in the black market and people are, are buying drugs with so gold and silver confiscate coins. confiscate it? Confis- they'll confiscation? confiscate it. Yeah, or they'll punish you for having it. And, or trying to use it, they'll do what they can to prevent you from using it. But nevertheless, the black market will exist. It always does. I, I was talking to a fellow here just yesterday that was raised in the Soviet Union, and uh, they, you know, they didn't allow uh, the black market on the surface. You were punished if you were using the black market and not using the Russian ruble and buying stuff in the company store. But never, but everybody did it. That's the point. And only those who were in, in misfavor with the government were the ones who were pol- uh, published. But all the commissars and all the communist officials were in the black market, too. So it was one of those things. We'll probably evolve into that kind of a situation for a while, I would imagine. So is crypto a better answer, then? Crypto? Well... Bitcoin. No, because they'll have complete control over the crypto. And if you want to use it for anything except buying lettuce or tomatoes, from your neighbor uh, or eggs, you know, you, uh, cryptos can be decentralized on a local level and you could have some privacy and I think it would probably work at a local level. But for going to the store and or buying gasoline or traveling or paying the rent and stuff like that, I'm afraid it, it's not going to work. Do you, um, I mean, you know, just getting in the, back in the future that the, these people that are putting this plan together do not want independent private crypto crypto to work and they're going to see that it doesn't work if they can. I mean, you're obviously still part of the banking system. Uh, you know, you mentioned about going to Bank of America and whatnot, but uh, so at some point you're still part of the system, right? Like, do you have plans that you want to be completely out of the system? Well, I don't think it's possible to be completely out of the system. I take my hat off to those who are trying to do that, but I, I don't think it's possible. Nevertheless, maybe it is, and I I wouldn't advise anybody not to try it. And so there are a lot of people, as you know, trying to do that. But you asked me what what I'm doing. Yes, what little savings I have, I've tried to put a lot of it into into one-ounce gold coins and silver coins, mostly silver, because the price of gold is so high. But beyond that, there's a time when you you can't eat gold coins or silver coins. And if you need food, I don't know, you know, and... uh, and somebody's got a limited supply of food, they're not willing to give you a portion of their limited supply for something they can't eat. So That's right. <clears throat> there comes a time when you have to say, wait a minute, we're not going to survive this system by just figuring out how to hide from it. We've got to prevent it from happening. That's what we should be focused on. Now, how do we escape it? No, we can't escape it if, if it comes to fruition. How do we prevent it? And what, that's where our focus should be. Well, that's a very good point. And can it be prevented? It must be prevented. It's an, there's no option. I mean, our lives and our freedom are completely at stake here. So my, my thinking, uh, Daniela, is that failure is not an option. I, I think in terms of 
what can I do? Don't, don't ask me if I can do it. My question is what it is that we'll do and focus on. I think we have a plan and we have a plan. It's, it's, it's a long shot, but, but it can work. Yeah. No, you know what? Sorry, not to interrupt you, but is a concern of yours that most people, um, you're not viewers of this show, but most people and not readers of your work, um, go about their lives having no clue what's happening in the financial system on a global monetary scale, don't even know about central bank. I've never even heard of a central bank digital currencies. So I, would you say that that's the majority of people living on the earth and the minority is really the people that are educated? So how, how could it be stopped if the majority are on TikTok and worried about, I don't know, what brand name cap they should be wearing? Well, the answer to that, I think, is easy. And the answer is that the majority never makes a difference. Never. Mm -hmm. Never has. History is always written by 1% of the population. Always. Those are the thought leaders. They create the revolutions. They create the new thought, the new systems. 1% creates. Then 3% are the activists that make it happen. And they attract a total, including themselves, of 15%. These are just round numbers, my observation. Then 15% get together and decide to do something about it. And that's that 15% led by the 3%, led by the 1% that make history happen. And if we have that group on each end of any contest, there's 15% on each end. And the 70% in the middle, they're walking around saying, what the heck is going on? You know, The old <laughs> saying is there, there are three kinds of people, those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who have the clue as to, that anything's even happening. You know, So that group never, never makes a difference. Well, that is, that is truly inspiring, and I'm happy you said that. And you are truly inspiring, um, and I know from all our interviews, the, the first thing people will say to me is, G. Edward Griffin looks absolutely amazing. I want to know what he's doing. I know every, every interview you share some, some tips, and, and, you, and, you, and you say you don't really, you know, you've told me you're not doing anything crazy. You, 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 you walk, you exercise, you eat healthy, but everyone still thinks you have a secret. So looking this secret? good and sounding this great. Oh, I don't know about any secrets. No, I don't have any secrets. I just do what, what everybody knows they should do. And I'm not very good at that either, by the way. I slip <laughs> all the time. So I'm just lucky, I suppose. Well, uh, you keep being you. Um, I want to thank you again for, for coming on my show. And I'll leave you with the last words. Uh, you know, I think your last statement was, was quite powerful and inspiring. But anything else you'd like to add uh, to the folks at home watching? Well, I, wanted to, I want to repeat what I just said a moment ago. We worry about what's happening in the world. And the first thing is, how do we escape? I honestly don't believe it's possible to escape. I think our focus needs to be turned to what can we do to change it, to keep it from happening, to reverse the trend. I know it can be done. It's things like this that always happen in history at the last minute, hopeless causes it. But take the American Revolution as a perfect example. There's no way in the world we had any expectation of winning that war against Great Britain or England. King George's troops were the most powerful military force in the world. There were a bunch of farmers there in, in the colonies uh, they couldn't even couldn't even add a column of numbers. Ignorant people, but they knew how to grow things and how to shoot a rifle. So, you know, there was not not a chance until Washington, in the last day, said, "Men, a lot of you guys go home on Christmas Day or New Year's Day. Your enlistments are over, and you're you're entitled to go home. But I'm going to cross the Delaware. Anybody with me tonight or tomorrow?" And we're going to surprise the enemy. And that's what they did. They crossed the Delaware cold night. Many of those soldiers didn't even have shoes. They had, they had to tie cloth around their feet. They, they got in these boats, went across the frozen river. They had one cannon in the boat. And when they got there at like 2, two o'clock in the morning, the Hessians were all asleep in their bunks, drunk a little bit because they were celebrating the Christmas holidays. 
and they found a, the British cannon in the in the middle of the road when they got to the little village where they were, and they turned the cannon around and fired it down the street. Boom! Three o'clock in the morning, these guys came out of their bunks, scared them. What? Whoa, whoa, what's going on? And they, without even shoes, the, the Hessians ran into the into the woods, and they they all surrendered. And that was the turning point of the war. A brilliant move on the part of Washington and a courageous move on the part of his men to do the impossible. It happens in history. I'm convinced it will happen somehow today. I would like to be that boom in some way. So and, and, I'll close with you, that. I just need some, you, more, some more boomers. <laughs> well, um, you have your upcoming uh, conference uh, coming up in, in, in August, your Red Pill Expo. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we yes, urge everyone. Uh, Red Pill Expo. Yes. Thank you for reminding me on that. Anybody that wants to, you know, think about getting involved in, in this battle, I mean, thinking about victory and not just survival, then this is the place to start. Red Pill University and Red Pill Expo yep. are the places to start and see what paths are open. So this is an event that comes, it comes up a couple of times a year, and uh, the next one is August the 12th and the 13th. Yep. So just go on redpilluniversity.org and you'll see some of the speakers that are going to be there and we'll have more. We usually have about usually about 18 speakers and it's 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 jam packed with information. There's a lot of booming going on there. So <laughs> well, I wish you, I'll see you uh, there. I, Maybe that'll be the place to start. I, I will. I wish you, uh, as always, luck with the conference. And I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, for joining me uh, and, and having this conversation with me. Like I said at the start of the part one, I know you rarely give interviews, so uh, I am truly humbled, and thank you for this. Well, thank you, Danielle. It's my pleasure. Maybe we'll do it again soon. I hope so. we counting on it. Okay. And right. <laughs> thank you all for watching. I hope you thoroughly enjoyed my conversation uh, with G. Edward Griffin. I know I did. Be sure to stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni Show and sign up at danielacamboni.com to stay on top of it all. That's it for me. Thank you for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.